Hello everyone, welcome. Oh, I see Clara. Hi folks, thanks for joining us this evening. Clara is just waiting to connect. Hi. <laughs> and there she is, hello. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you yourself. I'm very well. It's nice to meet you here. <laughs> it's nice to meet you too. Yes, we've been emailing back and forth for a few weeks now. So it's nice to, I know what your face looks like, but it's nice for you to know what mine looks like. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited about this too, because uh, the Milton community is close to my heart. I spent a lot of years in Hamilton. I used to ride up Rattlesnake Point all the time. I raced oh, there. Nice. And of course, Adam Vancouver did is like my little brother and he's your MP, so. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's right, he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So we'll just wait a few more minutes while folks find their way to us. Um, you had a good day? Absolutely, yeah, and uh, it's a beautiful day here. I'm in the Canadian Rocky Mountains in a little mountain town called Canmore, <laughs> and the sun yeah. has been shining. I mowed the lawn, <laughs> I pulled <Lovely>. some weeds. <laughs> That's a good day. <laughs> that's a productive day. I have to say, I don't think I've ever worked a lawnmower before. <laughs> that's okay. That's that a bucket list. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's not something you need to do in life. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Well, it's 7.02, and I know we just have you for a half an hour. So um, why don't we go ahead and we'll get started. And if folks find their way to us, then they're welcome to join. Um, so hi everybody, my name is Lisa. I'm the Teen Services Librarian at Milton Public Library and welcome to another edition of the Social Distance Book Club. So I think we're in edition sort of 13 or 14 now, Clara, so it's our absolute honor to have you on with us today. And for those of you that have been following us all along, welcome back. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome to our little slice of the internet where we talk about books with the people who write them. We're so glad that you're here. And we are so, so lucky today to have Clara as a guest. So Clara is a six-time Olympic medalist in both the Summer and the Winter Olympics, and she's a mental health advocate and author, and she has generally, generously offered her time today to talk to us about her book, Open Heart, Open Mind. So welcome, Clara. Thanks so much, Lisa. <laughs> It's our pleasure to have you and I have so many questions for you, but I know our folks will have questions as well. So if you'd like to chime in or you have a question for Clara, feel free to just leave them in the comments and I promise I will do my best to moderate and get to as many of them as we can. <laughs> But I sort of just wanted to jump into things, Clara, because this book is so beautiful and there's so many beautiful life lessons that are framed within the context of sport, but they're so easily extrapolated and applied to everyday life. And I have so many questions for you. And so I thought, let's just get started. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm great. on the start line. Okay, perfect. <laughs> That's a good sports metaphor. <laughs> so I wanted to start, Clara, with the dedication of this book, which I thought was so beautiful. It starts off um, for anyone, that the book is written for anyone who has struggled or is struggling. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write the book um, and what it means to you to be able to put your story out on paper and then send it out into the world. Yeah, you know, the dedication was really to open up the conversation about struggle. It's, it's such a massive part of the human condition that we all live between the struggle and the joy, every place and space in between those two, um, those two deep, deep human emotions and human experiences. I found as an athlete, the most I shared and talked about and the, the questions I was asked was all about when I succeeded, when I was happy, when I was smiling, when I was celebrating. Mm -hmm. And I, I really wanted to let people know that this is about real life. This isn't just about winning. This isn't just about, you know, the, the great moments that we want to expose and overexpose and, and just send out mm -hmm. to the world. I wanted to send out the whole spectrum of struggle to joy and especially the people who maybe have felt silenced, have felt alone in their struggle. I, I really just wanted to let each reader know that I'm sending my story out to you. And in return, I feel you. I see you. I hear you. Uh -huh. You are 
you are valued as a human being in your experience of struggle and let's learn to not silence our struggles. Let's, let's be bold with our struggles. Let's, let's honor our struggles. And if my story can help you do that, I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And I think just like you said, you know, we see um, as spectators, we see those moments on the podium, those sort of beautiful, excited uh, moments, or, you know, we do occasionally get glimpses into those those moments of struggle, um, where maybe something hasn't gone as planned. But I think what people don't see is is the behind of the scenes and everything that goes into becoming um, not only a world class athlete, but a beautiful human being too. And that um, sort of without without the peaks or without the valleys, there's not always a peak to sort of go up to. Yeah, and it's Lovely. just like honoring your whole self, you know, and um, you know, so many yeah. people specifically struggling with mental health issues, um, with, mm -hmm. with their mental wellness, as, as I have in my life and many, many people close to me have. It's like, you know, like, what are the words to even talk about that? I think we're still figuring out what those words are. So really <laughs> opening that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lovely. And so my next question is actually related to the title of the book. So for those of you that haven't read the book yet, um, Clara has a beautiful story about um, sort of the, the phrase that I was, I was told to you, open heart, open mind. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how you came up with that title, where that origin comes from and what that means to you? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it comes from a very wise person, uh, an elder from the Squamish First Nation. And uh, it was during a very special moment before the opening ceremonies in the Olympic Games in 2010. And he said to me very clearly, he said, I can't heal you. Nothing can heal you until you open your heart and open your mind to the supports that are everywhere, to the healing that is everywhere, to the love that is everywhere. And um, it really resonated with me because I was super stressed out and all of these life experiences and emotional experiences and difficulties I had throughout my life, traumas that I had buried so deep that I didn't know how to understand, let alone talk about. It just helped me begin to really think about letting all of these things surface and opening my heart and mind to the possibilities of healing. Um, and it was a powerful moment for me setting out into those games, for sure, but more so in life. And it, it has, it is something that it is, it resonated so deeply. It's kind of like the vibration I go off of in everything I do in life is like open heart, open mind. Like that's where the beauty lies and the beauty is everywhere. If you can open those two things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. And it's sort of the idea too, when you're, when you're open, you don't know what's going to happen. Something beautiful yeah. and unexpected could come along and yeah. it might be something that you hadn't thought of before or you hadn't encountered and sort of being open to accepting those experiences. I think um, that was yeah. such a beautiful lesson that I took from the book. Yeah. Um, thank you. Really, really Lovely. Um, and then my next question actually was a quote, and I'm not sure you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it was in the chapter with glowing hearts and you were speaking about, you know, when you took a little bit of a step back after your conference um, being named the flag bearer um, and um, an elder had said to you, you can only attract success for yourself if you want every single one of your competitors to be good and strong. When you wish good things for others, this comes back to you. And the strength to be kind is not often asked for, but this is perhaps the most important strength mm -hmm. to have. And that just resonated with me so much, um, particularly in this day and age with everything happening in the world. Um, it was such a beautiful sentiment. And how did you um, learn to embody that? You know, really, that was actually um, Uncle Denny, who's another elder, revered elder from the Squamish First Nation. And he <laughs> shared that, that, that gift of um, wisdom of experience and direction during a brushing off ceremony before the 2010 Olympics that was gifted to myself and to my, my circle of strength, my support team, um, to open our hearts and open our minds, as, as we already talked about. But that, that wisdom that he gave me, he, he spoke to me clearly as a competitor. He said, you know, I know you are heading to that starting line and you are, you're here to try to win. He's like, but this isn't about winning. As a human being, he said, you can't set out into anything with it just wanting for yourself. This is not just about sport. This is about life. And, and it really, you know, it changed my mindset. You know, as an athlete, and this sounds so like, 
just small. But, I, I, but honestly, like this has gone through my head. And I think anybody who's competitive and has been in that competitive realm, like you're like, okay, maybe they'll get sick or maybe they'll like, yeah. <laughs> you know, something will happen. They'll fall in their race and, you know, they be yeah. your competitors. But and then you're like, no, I would want that. You're like, oh, I want everyone to be good. And I've said that, you know, like I want everyone to be strong because it makes, it forces me to be stronger. It forces me to find mm -hmm. a better myself. But really wanting that from your heart is a different thing. And I never mm -hmm. challenged myself with that idea of actually looking at my competitors and saying like, yeah, man, I hope that you are fast and good and strong. And I hope you are the better than you ever have been. And, uh, and really like from my heart, willing that on everybody around me, yeah. it changed my mindset. I, it took me to the rink yeah. where I competed as a speed skater. I saw my competitors as human beings. I saw them as people and I'm just like, wow, I hope you have a good day. And I didn't say it, but I felt it and I projected yeah. it. And it just like, it took off so much stress because I stopped thinking about them. By thinking about them from my heart, I actually stopped thinking about how they were going to do. And it just turned me back to like, okay, now what do I get to do? What do I get to try to do here? And connected me with the moment I was in and those opportunities, the opportunity to skate at home on home territory for my niche, you know, for Canada, for every single heart and mind that was watching and connecting to those moments. So it was really, it was profound. And it, again, it translates into life because I think we can spend so much time wanting things for ourselves and everything in society <laughs> is project is, is like targeting us to like want everything that everybody else has instead of just like yeah. gra gratitude and kindness, I think are so important. And especially, you know, I think always, and now, yes, now, like, mm -hmm. like we clearly, I think, if somebody is not looking at themselves and thinking, what kind of a human being am I to everyone around me? Who mm -hmm. am I to the people around me um, in my community, yeah. in my city, in my country, in this world? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know who you are if you're not questioning that right now. So this goes to that yeah. as well, like wanting that goodness, that opportunity um, yeah. for everybody, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. It just really stuck with me. And I imagine too, um, sort of within the context of sport, um, knowing that others that are, are at their best, and if it's your day and you are winning, it makes you um, know that the person you were competing at or competing with was at their very best and you beat them and it was your day. Um, and I imagine that sort of um, makes the victory uh, a little bit sweeter, but knowing that it's because yeah. somebody else was at their best and not because something terrible happened yeah and it's just really it kind of like it allowed me to let go of the idea of winning as well it just was like I just want I just want to move on this ice beautifully yeah. and, and that that's what became my focus as well is just like just mm -hmm. that efficiency and and that that dance on the ice that the the motion of speed skating is and was and is for me it's just like oh, okay now I'm feeling it. I just want to bring my best mm -hmm. self. And um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was really great, great wisdom for life, for sure. <laughs> Beautiful. I love that. Um, and so my next question actually is from one of my coworkers, so Maria. Okay. Um, and I always sort of like to say, library people, we're not a sporting folk, not to paint everybody <laughs> with the same brush, but we don't really do sports, we read about them. <laughs> But Maria is our um, athlete on staff. She runs and she bikes and she does triathlons. And okay. so she has a really beautiful question. I know, she does it all. She's got all the bases covered for the rest of us. Um, so her question is, you know, how do you work through those times where you have a goal or a task that you need to complete and you're not feeling it? You're not feeling the motivation. You have tried giving yourself a pep talk, but you're just not feeling it but you still have this thing that you want to accomplish. You're just sort of not feeling it emotionally. Um, and she wondered if you had any tips for working through, you know, that sort of situation. Yeah, you know, it's really, I always look at it on the days when I was competing and training as an athlete at that level. It was just, what is my big picture? Always looking at where am I going and where does today fit into that? And, and just realizing that the days that are difficult, 
those could be practice for the day that really matters. Like the days where I wasn't motivated or I didn't feel good. And, and, you know, barring any, any physical or mental health situation that you could be compromising your overall health if you push through, just like kind of like the ups and downs of riding that roller coaster of preparation for something big. I would just think like, this could be the day of the Olympics. What are you going to do? And so it's like, I always went, would go back to my routine. I would go back to my team around me and I would realize like, okay, I'm not like intrinsically motivated every single day and that's okay. Feed off of the people around me, find the extrinsic motivation, Mm -hmm. lean on somebody for energy and support and just make that first step, get out the door. And I, I'm, a, I'm that way when I'm at home now, like as a non-athlete, as just a recreational like citizen athlete, I'm like, okay, I know if I just get out the door and start walking down the street, it'll turn into mm-hmm. something good. And that something good could just be a walk around the block or it could be end up being a run into the mountains and, or a bike ride. Yeah. But it's just like, really, if you, if you do have some kind of athletic goal, speaking to any athletes out there, it's just realizing that this is such a small piece of the bigger puzzle. And every time it's difficult, it's practice for the day where it can be this difficult or worse on the day. And if you get through this today, that only builds your resilience. And at the end of whatever you end up doing, you get to pat yourself on the back and be like, wow, I did that. And, and if you can't face it today, you're probably not going to be able to face it on the day that matters as well. And it kind of goes back to um, mindfulness practice that resonates deeply in my life and has for a long time. And there's a Vietnamese Zen master named Thich Nhat Hanh, who is, is a prolific writer, a wonderful, wonderful human being. And he writes about the miracle of mindfulness and he talks about washing the dishes. He's like, if you can't be present washing the dishes, if you're washing the dishes wishing you were doing something else, he's like, you won't be able to do anything else. You'll never be grounded and present. So start with washing the dishes. And so that's kind of like what I say with those hard days. You're washing the dishes. Bring yourself in the moment. Enjoy the warmth and the soap suds on your hands. And that's like kind of like get out the door and just sometimes it's okay to go through the motions. And that's enough, you know? <laughs> yeah, lovely. And I saw her comment go by, Claire. She was actually running and listening to this at the same time. So she said, okay. thank you. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Very dedicated. <laughs> um, and that sort of goes to my next question. And one of the lessons that I took from the book was the idea that Um, you know, sometimes winning isn't always being on top of the podium. It's knowing that in that time and that place that you did your absolute best and you reached the goals that you set for yourself. Um, And I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. How do you, you know, in a society where, you know, sort of accolades are often very sought after and that's what people use um, to feel good about themselves, how do you find that self-satisfaction and that sense of inner peace um, knowing that, perhaps to others, um, it looks like you didn't reach the top, but you know, in your heart that you did what you could that day. Mm, You know, it's really, I learned to always, always ask myself the question when I finished a race, how do you feel right now about what you did? How do you feel Mm -hmm. right now? And, And that happened in the 2010 Olympics, my last speed skating race. I, there were still about 10 skaters to go and I had broken the, the, the rink record. I had the w- leading time and I was just like, I knew I had just skated the race of my life and I celebrated. And I was just like, feel this now. This is what you dreamed of. And you might end up in 11th place <laughs> and it doesn't right. matter. And I celebrated like I won the Olympics and I was like, I could look like a total jerk at the end of this. But I don't care because this is how much it means to me. And I ended up in third place that day. And some people can say that, you know, whatever. I failed to defend my Olympic title that I'd won four years earlier. I didn't care because it was about the quality of what I did, not the quantity. And I think it is very, very difficult in the world that we're in right now to allow yourself to feel a sense of pride and a sense of, of um, meaning in what you do if it is not like the biggest, the best, the shiniest. And I think if mm-hmm. anything, what mindfulness and, and, and really like being in nature, being with myself, um, being having moments and, and great quantities of quiet in my <coughs> life have allowed me to connect 
to that place of knowing who I am and feeling a satisfaction that others may not project on me and being really happy and content with that. And, um, and really, I take that also to being on the outside of another person um, and, and looking at what other people do and realizing how important it is to give people encouragement and to acknowledge something special that you see or witness mm -hmm. and not to judge it off of the expectation of results. But when yeah. you see somebody that has done something that means something to them, just honor it, you know, like give them that yeah. pat on the back. And I think encouragement is something that um, as, as well as kindness is something that we forget to give to others and forget to give to mm -hmm. ourselves. So, you yeah. know, connecting to the, those ideas for me has helped me, feel a sense of satisfaction in the smallest things. And when I'm able to feel a sense of satisfaction in those tiny, tiny base layer things, I know that I can bring myself into the big things that I do and still not have any connection to the need of a success at the end to feel good and, and um, satisfied as a human being. Lovely. And I think, yeah, I think that must be something that takes quite a lot of practice. I know even for myself, that's still something yeah. that I'm, that I'm working on is not just um, necessarily feeling acceptance from other people, but that sense of self acceptance that I know I've yeah. done my best and being okay with that. Sometimes that's yeah. really hard. It's um, so difficult. So really yeah. And it's a life's work, right? It is a lifetime of work <laughs> to, to bring yourself back to that place. And, um, but I think it's important work and it's worthwhile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so sort of um, also tying into that a little bit, you talked about a little bit your switch from cycling back to speed skating. And you talked about, um, you know, sort of going out of cycling, being on top, but it not being something that you felt passionate about or that you loved anymore. And I wondered, um, it sort of struck me, I, I, I imagine have ex experienced it myself, even, you know, being stuck in this place where you have something that you're really good at, but you don't love it. Do you stay? Do you move on? How do you how do you navigate that? If you have the opportunity to change, change just as hard as it is terrifying and as uncertain as it is. I am 47 years old and I look back on my life and all of the things that people you know, say, wow, you did this and you did that. It is only because I was like, I just have to go and try this new thing and go back to being a beginner. And, and you know, I cannot say enough and this is, I know that not everybody has the chance to change and the opportunity and the safety to change mm -hmm. their environment, their job, whatever it is. But if you do and mm -hmm. you feel that call inside, you feel something inside where you're just like, I just need to know this. I need to try this. I think mm -hmm. I need to try to be that. You have to go and explore mm -hmm. it. If you feel that call inside, and it goes back to Joseph Campbell, the mythological historian who talks about... Um, the hero's walk and, and um, the hero with a thousand faces he uses comparative mythology. And he talks about when the hero gets the call to go into that unknown and to experience something, you can go and do that. And it's called following your bliss. And if you don't answer that call, you are, de you're going to be in like misery. <laughs> you're, you're doomed yeah, yeah. because you'll always wonder what if I had, and, if I can say this, of all the traveling I've done um, on the hiking trails, on bike tours, mm -hmm. on all these like long distance um, traveling things I've done over my life, I meet people, elderly people often, and they say, oh, I, I dreamed of doing that when I was your age. Even my age right now, I dreamed of doing that. Do that while you're young. I should have done it and I didn't. And look at me now. Mm -hmm. My body's broken. I can't do that. And so it, it's really just when you feel something strongly inside, you have to go and see. You have to go and see. And, um, and, the, and the, the irony of it is you can go and see and you can just be like, oh, my God, this is life. And nobody around you will understand. Everyone will say you made a mistake. And you may come back with, with the, what you think is wisdom and people t will tell you you're a fool. But it's still worth it. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's true. I think if you have that sense of inner peace and you know that you're not going to think back on it and regret that you never yeah. did something or you never tried something, um, I think it's like a life experience. It, it is. And uh, those three words, follow your bliss. They're the beautiful words of, of wisdom, of direction in life. And I, I read those words uh, probably 22 years ago now, and they've resonated deeply with <laughs> me since. Mm -hmm. I love that. There's like, um, there's a certain um, freedom yeah. to, to just that statement, like, just go and do it. And it's going to yeah. be okay. And I love yes. that. I think that's <laughs> really lovely. Um, so I, I had another question that came through. And it was, do you have one moment either sport or non-sport that you are particularly proud of because you followed your bliss or because you triumphed over something um, and it could be sport, non-sport? Oh, I mean, there, there, there's many moments, but one recent one was uh, last year I, um, I did, so I, I walked about six months of the year. I was on hiking trails in America and um, I had just hiked the Pacific Crest Trail by myself from the Washington border with Canada down to the Mexican border with the United States. So it was a huge walk, 4,300 kilometers. I was like, wow, like I did it. And, and just so like on so many levels. But after that, I went and visited some friends in Southern California. And I had this dream of doing this really epic walk from this place called Death Valley, which is the homelands of the Timbisha Shoshone people, all the way up to the highest, it's the, basically the lowest point in the, con in the continent, contiguous United States, up to the highest point. So it went from 250 feet below sea level over a couple of mountain ranges up to 14,500 feet. And I really wanted to do this walk. It was about 250 kilometers. I couldn't find anyone to do it with me. And there was no trail. It was a route. And I was so yeah. scared. I was like, well, I can't do it alone. No one does this alone. Yeah. And I talked to my husband, Peter, and he's like, of course you can do it alone. And I spoke to a friend of mine who's a local mountaineer in that area. And he's like, of course you can do that alone. And so they basically Love convinced it. me to set out and do it. And, and I was so scared because I'm like, what if something happens? I'm in the middle of Death Valley. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know what? I did it. And I realized, and both Peter said to me and my friend, Jeff Putman, the mountaineer said to me, they said, you're going to see how many skills you have. You're going to see... My friend Jeff said, no matter what happens, you can hike your way out of it, you know? And I had my in reach and all that. I had this safety net behind me if something were to happen. But I did that walk. And man, when I got up to Mount Whitney and I went up a Mountaineer's route and I came down and I was running down the trail and I had the biggest smile and someone saw me, they were coming up the trail. And they, the guy said, you look like the happiest person on earth right now. Where have you come from? And I said... <laughs> I just looked at him. I said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. <laughs> but it was because, you know, I was really, really afraid and intimidated by this. Mm -hmm. um, and even having just walked 4,300 kilometers alone, I was afraid of it. And I did it. Yeah. And I, I was just like, wow, I could have not done this. I could have not tried. And I was, I'm just, every time I set out mm -hmm. and I do something, when I'm a little bit intimidated, it's always the right thing to go and try to do it. And sometimes I don't always finish things, but the point is that I went out and I tried. Yeah, yeah. So that was pretty special. Exactly. Oh, that's very exciting. Yeah, I imagine I'm not a particularly outdoorsy person myself. So like even hearing you talk about it, I'm, I don't think I could ever do that. But then, you know, I think sort of- Oh, our, it's baby steps here. though. It's baby steps. Yeah. Like tw 25 years ago, course. I had never hiked or anything. So it's, yeah. <laughs> wow, what an accomplishment. How long did it take you to do that walk? Oh, that took about, that one was seven days. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. Wow. And the, the Pacific Crest Trail, <laughs> the Pacific Crest Trail took 99 days. So it was a, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. That is so cool. <laughs> um, and so we're just coming to about 7.30. So I just had one more question that I wanted to ask you because we've had a dialogue going about the importance of talking about mental health. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you know, your book is so open and so honest about the struggles that you've been through, struggles that other competitors have been through. Um, yeah. And you have taken on a role with Bell Let's Talk. And I wanted to ask you, about your work with that and why it's so important to you to be an advocate um, and a leader in discussing mental health and, and also working to destigmatize it as well. 
Yeah, it was, um, that, that was a beautiful journey with the Let's Talk campaign. And uh, it's been three years since I stepped down as, as the spokesperson. And so I guess I can maybe be considered as the founding spokesperson for the campaign. Um, but I'll always be connected to it. And, uh, and honestly, wherever I go in the world, um, without people knowing it, I think they, people feel when they're accepted, when they, it's a safe space. <laughs> And what I've noticed yeah. with anybody who has struggled, who has lived, you know, a, a lived mental health experience, um, such as myself with depression, with disordered eating, with, with, with different things, with my family members have been on their mental health journeys too, and with many friends, is you just like, it, it's like you hold space for people. And people have done that for me. And I feel, I hope that I do that for people where, you know, I'll meet someone and I'll never see them again. And they say, I've never told anyone this before, but I don't know why I'm telling you, but mm -hmm. I just want to share this with you. And you listen and their voice is heard. And for me, because I had not, I didn't know how to talk about these things, about addiction, mental health issues. And having mm -hmm. had that opportunity with the Let's Talk campaign was life changing for me. And it's something that, even though I'm not in that position, I feel like I'm in that position as a human being for the rest of my life. Yeah. And the human to human yeah. connection of being a listener and holding space for people is something that is a gift that mm -hmm. comes into my life regularly. And it's, um, it's something that I think each of us has the capacity for. I also think that everybody has a story. Everybody has a story to share and tell and to teach with. And mine is my own. I've heard so many people have trusted me with their stories and have taught me so much about what it means to be human, has have helped me learn to accept struggles within myself, have guided me to places where I can explore healing. Um, and, and it's been just a wild ride that continues. And I'm just so grateful to be in the community of survivors, you know, and um, to be able to encourage other people to step into their own healing path and to, onto their own journey and to hold their own space and hold space for others has been a gift. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Clara. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I just wanted to thank you for spending the half an hour with us, for answering all of the questions that I had and, and giving um, so much inspiration to our community. Um, we're so proud Thanks, of you, Lisa. Sarah Milton, in our country, <laughs> for everything that you've done, all of your work. Um, and we're so, so privileged to have been able to have a little bit of your time. So thank you Thanks, so, Lisa. so much. And uh, I also um, want to say thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. And um, I've seen some little questions below, and I've seen your encouragement. I'm, I'm looking down as we've been speaking and sharing. And, <laughs> and I also I just want to let everyone know that message me on Instagram. I try to go through all the messages. Sometimes there's these, like, caches of messages that I'll find it, like, months later. But I always try to respond and um, and we're in this together and I love you all and I'm so grateful for everyone for tuning in and being with us today and celebrating reading, yeah. right? Like books are the best. Mm -hmm. Our I, I read that your library is still doing you're sticking with the curbside pickup. Our library here in yeah. Canmore, Canmore Public Library, just started that mm -hmm. a few weeks ago and I've gone twice yes. to pick up books and I'm just like Oh, oh, public goodness. libraries are the best. <laughs> yes, it's such a beautiful feeling when you take a bag of books out and the whole family's there in the car yes. or maybe just one individual and they're so excited to have their books. It's such yeah. a, we, we so appreciate all of those beautiful comments and all of the lovely feedback. It makes us know that what yeah. we're doing is worthwhile <laughs> and it's meaningful in people's lives. So yeah, thank right you everybody. on. So thanks to the whole team <laughs> at the Milton Public Library as well. <laughs> All right. Okay, Claire. Well, thanks again for everything. Best of luck in all of your endeavors. And yeah. thank you for your generous offer for our community. If they have yeah. questions, you um, can find her just linked from our Instagram page. Yeah. Thanks, Take Lisa. Care, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>